Herman Melville seems to have a bee in his bonnet about work. In one of his most famous stories, Bartleby the Scrivener, the title character one day stops working and instead just tells his boss, I would prefer not to, whenever he is asked to perform some task. The end result of his work resistance is imprisonment in the tombs. There he continues his resistance by refusing to eat and eventually dies of starvation. This is work resistance taken to the most extreme and, and perhaps is hyperbolic, but it is hardly the only thing Melville has to say on the subject of work and work resistance. In the Tartarus of Maids, Melville gives us a detailed description of a paper factory employing young women. As the title tells us, it is hell, and it's presented in such a creepy and unnerving way that the Library of America included it in their collection of American horror fiction. Melville wrote, Something of awe now stole over me as I gazed upon this inflexible iron animal. Always more or less machinery of this ponderous, elaborate sort strikes in some mood strange dread into the human heart, as some living, painting behemoth might. But what might made this thing I saw so specially terrible to me was the metallic necessity, the unbudging fat fatality which governed it. Through here and there, I could not follow the thin, gauzy veil of pulp in the course of its more mysterious or entirely invisible advance, yet it was indubitable that at these points where it eluded me, it still marched on in unvarying docility to the autocratic cunning of the machine. A fascination fastened on me. I stood spellbound and wandering in my soul. Before my eyes, there, passing in the slow procession along the wheeling cylinders, I seemed to see glued to the pallid incipients of the pulp a yet more pallid faces of all the pallid girls I had eyed that heavy day. Slowly, mournfully, beshegingly, yet unresistantly, they gleamed along their agony, dimmed, dimly outlined in the imperfect paper like the print of the tormented face on the handkerchief of San Veronica. So he doesn't think too much of factory work. And it's hardly surprising that an office worker would rather go to jail than push paper anymore. But it goes beyond this. Melville's first three novels are an extended narrative of a sailor trying to quit his job. When we first meet this character in the novel Typee, he's a frustrated sailor on a whaling ship. We don't get his name, but he comes to be, be known later as Tumu, which is how the local Pacific Islanders call him. The character gives us a long justification about why he's exploited, how he was lied to, and the real risk of death he faces if he does not escape the ship. So he goes and talks another sailor into jumping ship with him, and he escapes to the island. They eventually f uh, find their way to the lands of the cannibal Taipei people, and Tomu at least has a fairly good time there. He begins to report extensively on their culture and ways of living, but never far from his mind is the fact that European culture is work-heavy and the Taipei are a leisure society. In fact, he makes a note of identifying one Taipei woman who is special because she works so much. The Taipei live in a post-scarcity culture where the food grows on trees and no one needs to work much. But he gets restless and a bit worried about his future, so he finds his way back to European civilization on another whaling ship. And this brings us to Melville's second novel, Omu. In Omu, the character is known as Taipei, based on his previous adventures. He quickly participates in a formal resistance after conditions on the ship deteriorate quite badly. In punishment for this, the crew and him are put in, jail, in a jail in Tahiti. The jail is a minimum security, to be sure. Taipei and another friend eventually leave the prison to take a job on a potato farm run by two American castaways. But they do not stay long, and they begin traveling the society islands looking for work and adventure. The novel ends with a failed job interview when, after they try to get employment in the court of a Polynesian queen. In Marty, Melville's third novel, our author takes this character on a wild, mystical adventure through a mythological Pacific, visiting dozens of islands and societies of every type on a search for a woman named Ila. But did I mention the novel begins with our sailor, and now he has the name Taji, jumping ship? At the end of the novel, despite finding a paradise, he sets out for the seas to search for Ila. And just to make the point clear, this paradise he finds is a communist culture with no poverty, where work is shared. And yet, he decides he would prefer not to serve and sets off. And that is how the novel and this loose trilogy of works that begin Melville's career ends. Restlessness over work and life continues in his other novels. Redburn longed for the sea, so he signs on board a merchant ship heading to Britain. In Britain, 
He spends a lot of time exploring Liverpool and eventually London, always moving. And then he returns to the ship and comes back to America. At the end, he decides he didn't want to be a sailor after all. The work stunk and all his romanticism was based on the delusion. In Moby Dick, we are told by Ishmael, the, the narrator, that sailing is something he does when he gets anxious. Some years ago, never mind how long precisely, having little or no money in my purse and nothing particular to interest me on shore, I thought I would sail around a little and see the watery parts of the world. There's a way I have of diving off the spleen and re regulating the circulation. Whenever I find myself growing grim about the month, whenever it is a damp, drizzly November in my soul, whenever I find myself involuntarily pausing before coffin warehouses and bringing up the rear of every funeral I meet, and especially whenever my hypos get to such the upper hand on me that it requires a strong moral principle to prevent me from deliberately stepping into the street and meth methodically knocking people's hats off, then I count it's high time to go to sea as soon as I can. This is my substitute for a pistol and ball. With the philosophical flourish, Cato throws himself upon his sword. I quietly take to the ship. So it is pretty clear that Melville creates characters that are frustrated with their jobs. But instead of showing them organizing unions or resisting collectively, he tends to show them quietly moving off or refusing work. We have one example of this, the collective resistance described in Omu. But there, Melville is careful to describe how bad conditions became on the ship and how resentment was very broad across all of the men on the ship. And he spends about a third of the novel doing that in the beginning of the story. Now, I'm not sure this type of work resistance is effective, but I really do understand the restlessness that comes from taking a nine to five job. This is one of those things that makes reading Melville such a treat for me. Rather than digging through his work for symbols and esoteric themes as so many people try to do, why not take I would prefer not to, to be a catchphrase for much, if not all, of his writing. In the Uber economy filled with David Graeber's bullshit jobs, zero-hour contracts, boring busy work, low wages, daily humiliation, and brutal exploitation, let's celebrate our li literary heritage that reminds us that we can say no to all of that, even if it means living with a tribe of cannibals sometimes. Thanks for watching. If you want to see more of my videos looking at some, some musings I have based on my reading of American literature, please subscribe to my channel. I'll also be including book reviews and other topical videos.